Hi, I'm physician and journalist Dr Norman Swan. And I'm health reporter Tegan Taylor. And this is What's That Rash? The podcast where we answer the health questions that simply everyone is asking. So this week's questions come from, or question, comes from both Naomi and Marion. Naomi says, I'm wondering if you could settle the debate on which is healthier, butter or margarine. And Marion says, could you clarify something for me, please? After listening to you talk about fat in dairy products, I've relaxed my habits of reducing my intake of butter and cheese. I thought I heard you say there was something in dairy that did not cause it to increase cholesterol in the body. I believe, says Marion, butter is a far healthier product than the myriad of margarines on the market. Am I correct? Well, let's, as we always do, and what's the rest? Go back to basics. What's butter? What's margarine? I'll go with butter. Butter's a very ancient product. It takes about 20 litres of whole milk to produce one kilo of butter, which is about 88% saturated fat. So it's a mixture of water, salts, and it comes from churning the cream of cow's milk. It's a solid emulsion. What's margarine? It's, well, you it's kind of the original ultra-processed fruit, isn't it? <laughs> well, it is. It's basically, in a similar sense to butter, it's an emulsion of fat. But the fat in margarine comes from, well, originally it came from beef tallow. These days it comes usually from vegetable oils. So what's the history of margarine? Well, I would like to actually talk about the history of butter first because I didn't know, no one really knows where these foods completely originated. But the idea is that butter came from either people on horseback, either Mongols on horseback or nomads on camel's backs. Oh, so and, the jiggling of the milk. In, oh, yeah, in, yeah, exactly. All right. But it was probably either mare's milk. It might not have been cow's milk originally, although the word butter actually comes from boss, meaning cow. Like it's, it's uh, cow that, fat. that must be a terrible disappointment. You're, you're riding all day across the steppe and you're <laughs> looking forward to a good drink of milk and at the end of it... You just squeeze out a bit of butter. Blech. Yeah, you just said it takes 20 litres of milk to get one kilo of butter. I can't imagine how much butter is actually in your water skin or <laughs> what are your, your milk skin. Yeah, your skin. <laughs> your skin. It's, it, either way, it sounds disgusting. Humans really will eat almost anything if they're hungry enough, and that's where most of our foods, I think, came from. It's a good story. Margarine we know a little bit more about. Basically what happened is that people loved butter, and in the 1800s, they had a butter shortage in France because of the Napoleonic Wars. And basically, there was a prize offered for anyone who could produce a butter substitute because the French Navy wanted fat on their table and they needed something that wasn't going to turn rancid. So this guy called Hippolyte Megay Maurier, if you speak French, feel free to email me and Hippolyte. Uh, criticize. <laughs> Hippolyte, if, Hippolyte. I may, if I may say so. Yeah, well. uh, that rash at abc.net.au is where you can send your pronunciation concerns. Anyway, he invented margarine. He called it oleo margarine because it was made with beef fat and margarites meaning pearl in Greek because it looked like a pearl colour. It's white and shiny, right? So, so the goal here was to create something that was spreadable, that looked like butter but didn't go rancid. Well, yeah. I mean, looking and tasting like butter I think was a fairly large stretch at the time. I don't think it probably tasted that similar to butter, but it definitely did the job of lubricating your bread and whatever else you're putting on your bread when you were a hungry soldier out on the front. And so then... Uh, well, just as a spoiler here, to come back to the original questions here that we've got, if this was a 19th century podcast, we'd have to say it's not very good for you, based on Murier. Murier. <laughs> it's basically beef tallow. So, yes. Anyway, it was the industrial age. We could make this thing that was a bit like butter. And by the late 19th century, there was 37 different companies manufacturing margarine in the US. So we've moved from Europe over to the US now. And there was a big backlash from the butter industry because they saw them as um, yeah, the dairy, cu the cutting dairy their state, lunch. That's right. The dairy states thought this was awful and they tried all sorts of things to prejudice margarine sales. Well, part of the thing was the colour. So like I said, the marguerite margarine part of margarine's name comes from the word for pearl. So it was a pearly white colour, maybe a little unappetising if you're used to yellow butter on your plate. It was and basically so, grey. Yeah, I mean, grey, but pearl, when you say something's pearl-coloured, it sounds nice. When you say something's grey, it sounds awful. 
<laughs> anyway, they wanted to dye it yellow and the butter industry didn't want a bar of that because they said it was too much of a masquerade and they wanted them to have to colour it some unsightly colour. One proposition was that it should be dyed pink, which I think people maybe have heard of that before, but they never actually kind of managed to get that through because... Supreme Court, for some reason in those days, made rational judgments and said, (laughs) you know, you can't impose artificial dyes on people. Yeah, basically you can't force an adulteration of a food. So they weren't allowed to dye it yellow, but you were allowed to sell it with a packet of yellow food colouring that you could mix in yourself. And so there you go. And here, and here's the thing, of course, is that a lot of butter naturally is actually white because it depends on what the cows are feeding on. And some dairy producers will colour the butter a little bit yellow. Exactly. So there's a little bit of the pot calling the kettle pearl coloured. I don't know. Anyway, what follows the late... 19th century, spoilers, is a really hard few decades for humans in the West. There was the Depression, there was World War II. Margarine became a necessity for people who wanted butter substitutes because there were shortages. And then we also had improvements in manufacturing. It, it really kind of got a foot in the in the market in a way that it may not have if, if history had unfolded differently. The key here is that you want an oil-based product to be solid at room temperature. Mm. And that requires a fair bit of chemical engineering. And margarine started in the days before it was really known the difference in health benefits or risks between saturated fats and other kinds of fats. So there was no guarantee that margarine in the old days was lower in saturated fats. And then the manufacturing process often produced these highly toxic fats called trans fats. What is a trans fat? It's one of those things that I've, I see 0% trans fats on packets of things. I thought they were kind of outlawed anyway. What actually is it? Well, not outlawed because it's quite hard to eliminate them altogether. So trans fats are a side effect of the industrial process of turning oils into these spreadable fats. And it's called hydrogenation. And trans fats are only partially hydrogenated fats. And they are extremely toxic to the arteries, causing atherosclerosis, which is a disease that causes heart attacks and strokes. Butter has trans fats too, but they're natural and it's not known what their toxic effects are. But you do not want to be eating any trans fats at all in your diet if you can avoid them. So that sounds bad. When we hear about margarine in more recent decades having like lowers your cholesterol or or has healthy fats in it. What's happening at the fat level in butter versus margarine? Well, that's where the change in margarine has occurred over recent years. And the dominant fat in a lot of margarines, not all, but a lot of margarines is polyunsaturated fats. And that's what makes a difference now in terms of the health outcome between butter and margarine. So let's start with butter and the saturated, so butter is mostly saturated fat. When you look at the evidence, so this is, is butter going to increase your risk of of heart disease? We've just just said that trans fats are really toxic for your arteries and you really don't want to be taking trans fats in anything if you can avoid it. And if you're taking a food with trans fats, it's got to be at really low levels. But what about butter as a dominantly saturated fat product? When you look at the evidence, and there's been some very large studies, and we'll put the links to some of those in our show notes, when you look at the very large studies, most of them do not convincingly show a risk from whole fat dairy products, which would include butter. Now, this is not to say, it's a very nuanced conversation because saturated fats are bad for your arteries. So take saturated fats in the form of red meat or other products, non-dairy products, they are not good for your coronary arteries. And then there's a paradox that it looks as though saturated fat in dairy products does not seem to have the same adverse effects on your arteries. And it's not that it's, they're good for your arteries, it's just that there's something in whole dairy which mitigates the effect of saturated fat. So I'm not here to recommend that everybody goes on to whole fat dairy versus low fat, because there are some studies which do show increased risks. But by and large, the risks aren't what you'd expect for the level of saturated fat. So 
a modest amount of butter in your diet, for example, spreading it on toast in the morning, in the morning is unlikely to affect your uh, low-density lipoprotein cholesterol to any significant extent. That's your bad cholesterol. So That's your bad cholesterol. Basically, it shouldn't make that much of a difference. It seems to be relatively neutral. Then the question is, which is better for you, margarine versus butter? And most head-to-head comparisons would suggest that margarine with polyunsaturated fats in them do reduce your cholesterol. So butter is neutral by and large, but margarine is actually active on your cholesterol and reduces it, particularly the margarines that are designed to reduce your cholesterols with the plant sterols in them. And it's because the polyunsaturated fats compete with the uptake of saturated fat, particularly cholesterol, from your gut. And they get preferentially taken up from your diet rather than the saturated fat itself, particularly the cholesterol. So polyunsaturated margarines, if you're talking about coronary heart disease and you've got a problem with cholesterol, are probably good for you. Butter is neutral. So it sounds like the answer to your question then is which is better for you? It probably is margarine. Yes. Some people would argue that there's a problem. You're always going to have problems with margarines because they're manufactured and they're an ultra-processed food. But when they've looked at it, particularly in relation to coronary heart disease, particularly the margarines with phytosterols in them are good for you. They reduce your cholesterol level. But if your cholesterol is okay, it's not that high, and you're not taking that much butter in your diet, you know, essentially you're, you've got butter there to spread on your toast or a tiny pan of butter to fry your egg, then you're really not going to come to any harm. Well, that's reassuring. If you like butter, or well, kind of on both counts, I suppose, we've spoken almost exclusively about artery health. Are there any other health parameters that we should be taking into consideration when we're talking about butter and margarine? Yes. I mean, you, these are fats, and so both are calorie-dense. So if you're going to be taking a mountain of margarine, a mountain of butter, you're likely to put on weight. And there is some evidence that if you take calories as fat, you're more likely to put it on as fat. Some people thought that was a myth for a while, but it looks as though there's a metabolic pathway that you're more likely to put on fat. And therefore, there's a route between a high-fat diet and type 2 diabetes. And it's largely through the weight that you put on the fat around your waist that also translates to an increased risk of cancer and poorer outcomes if you've got cancer. So that's about weight gain and that's about dominating your diet with fat rather than a mix of fat, carbohydrate and protein. Which really isn't the question we're being asked. We're really being asked about the comparison between the two. And I suppose what it kind of plays into is this idea of focusing on particular foods or particular nutrients and not looking at the big dietary pattern, the overall diet that someone's eating across their day, week, life. And um, if you're really following, uh, you know, Mediterranean diet, you're probably eating a diet of nutrient-dense whole foods. You're probably getting fats from nuts and olive oil and avocado. You might not need as much margarine or, or butter in your diet anyway. And tell me if I'm wrong, Norman, like the small changes that you might be getting from butter versus margarine really kind of get lost in the noise of a broadly healthy or broadly unhealthy diet. With one exception, um, much as we on What's That Rash love the Mediterranean diet, (laughs) is the level of your cholesterol and whether you need to get that down. A Mediterranean diet tends to be a bit neutral for your cholesterol. The reason the cholesterol comes down on a Mediterranean diet when you shift from a Western kind of diet with high quantities of red meat, high quantities of saturated fat, is that you remove saturated fat from your diet without thinking about it because you've replaced it with monounsaturated fats, as you say, in avocado and in olive oil. But there's other things that happen in a Mediterranean diet, which are the bioactive compounds that go along with that. And that's one of the theories, by the way, behind why whole fat dairy might not be quite as bad for you as it would have been predicted by its saturated fat content content is that there are probably bioactive compounds in whole dairy which help to counteract the effects of the saturated fat. So there's a bit of a battle going on. But if you need to lower your cholesterol and you're dipping your bread in olive oil, you might be better off spreading it with phytosterol margarine because that's going to reduce your cholesterol further than a Mediterranean diet almost certainly, although the studies have you know, I can't quote you a study that's good enough to hang your hat on or hang your arteries on. 
So I've spoken a bit about the fact that margarine had a bit of a a makeover, a glow up in the last few decades. But then more recently than that, there's been sort of a shift back towards butter. What's going on? I don't think they really know what's going on. In Finland, where they had very high rates of coronary heart disease, some of the highest rates of coronary heart disease in the world, and they had this huge public health campaign where they try to change people's behaviour, move them towards a more Mediterranean-style diet, and so on. Oh, wait. Sorry. Thank you. I mean, really, you're very slow on the uptake today, Tegan. <laughs> and they've monitored people since that intervention, which did reduce coronary heart disease rates and shift people away from saturated fat, is people have drifted back towards butter. And it's not entirely clear why. It's partly habit, but it's also a belief that it's natural and therefore healthier for you. There has been a return to butter in places like Australia as well, bulletproof coffee, where you stir butter into coffee, and some nutritionists who argue that saturated fat is actually good for you, but it's actually not good for you. That's misleading. So we're always sort of a little wary about giving cut and dried advice on what's that rush. It's more like vibes and guidelines, but bottom and, line... And a schmear, you know, and a, sh- schmear. a schmear on your toes. <laughs> a schmear on your toes. But bottom line for Naomi, Marion, and anyone else who's wondered this question. If you love butter and you're taking it modestly, and it's mainly for your toast in the morning, and you're not having massive amounts of butter in your cooking, then stick with it. The evidence would suggest you're not doing yourself any harm. If you've got an issue and you want to get your cholesterol down, then a polyunsaturated margarine, particularly one with phytosterols, is the way to go. But not necessarily instead of medications, it's something you've got to talk over with your doctor because medication is still a highly effective way of getting your LDL cholesterol down to very low levels. Do you have a favourite butter recipe? Well, is it just butter? <laughs> Well, I do like butter and I do like a little bit of butter when I'm frying an egg and it's hard to make a really nice crumble without butter. Oh yeah, I love a crumble. And yes, I think a butter fried in a butter fried in egg. Exactly. I said what I said. No. And and one croissant on a Saturday with your coffee. Naomi Marion, thank you so much for the question. You can send your questions to that rash at abc.net.au. Also, where you can send your feedback, which is what Matt has done. Norman, we spoke a couple of weeks ago about running and whether running is good or bad for your knees. Matt says he would like to contribute an N equals 1 study. Excellent. We love N equals 1 studies. And to remind new listeners to watch that rash, what N equals 1 studies is, is, this is an experiment on yourself. On yourself or just on one person. So this is Matt's mum. Matt's mum has been running her whole life, sometimes 50 Ks plus per week when she was younger. She's now in her mid-70s and was recently told by a physio that she has the knees of a 40-year-old. Matt says, I found it encouraging as a casual runner myself, often worried I'm destroying my knees. It's an N equals one, but it gives me hope that my knees will be going strong into my 70s. And he finishes, mum is still running even competing in the city to surf with times that would put some of my runner friends in their 30s to shame. Great story, Matt. And it goes with the evidence that running is good for your joints. It's not going to wear them out. When you hear stories about exercise and joint wearing out, it's usually that sport has done it, multiple injuries, say in rugby or netball or something else. That's not great for your joints. But running, jogging, go for it. So we just congratulated ourselves on getting it right. But I, we have a, I think it's a correction or an apology required. Uh, there's an email from Liam who says, in this week's episode, as in, oh, it was a while ago now, Norman made disparaging remarks about cavoodles only being able to walk 100 metres. Charlie, my three-year-old cavoodle, would like me to inform Norman that at least once a week he joins me on my 8 to 10 kilometre run and will be participating in an upcoming dog-friendly trail run in October. I am so sorry, Charlie. I will not give any apologies to cats, but to Cavoodles, <laughs> I, I'm, on, I'm on my hands and knees begging forgiveness. <laughs> on your hands and knees in front of a Cavoodle, you're going to get licked in the face, Norman. Yes. Well, thank you, Liam. Thank you, Matt, for your emails. That rash at abc.net.au is our email address again, and we'll catch you again here next week. See you then. See you then.